this was a long time ago, the peace of wild things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. The grace of the world. Take that a little further for me. What? Well, I meant it in the religious sense. The uh, people of people of religious faith know that the world is is maintained. Um, every day by the same force that created it. It's an article of my faith and belief that all creatures live by breathing God's breath and participating in his spirit. And this means that the whole thing's holy, the whole shooting match. There are no sacred and unsacred places. They're only sacred and desecrated places. Hello. Welcome back to the pastor's study. Glad that you're with me here today. You just heard uh, Wendell Berry. Uh, this was a documentary series that was uh, on PBS a number of years ago that featured Wendell Berry. And uh, you heard him sharing and uh, reading one of his poems. Uh, Wendell Berry is somebody that I've uh, grown to admire and appreciate quite a bit over the last number of years. Uh, Wendell Berry is a, uh, a poet, an essayist, a novelist, <clears throat> uh, a man of faith, and he's also a Kentucky farmer and has um, been farming his ancestral farm for the last uh, many, many years, 30, 40 years. Um, he was somebody who had a promising career uh, as an academic and um, had spent time in Europe and had every opportunity uh, in front of him to uh, climb, uh, climb the, the ladder within uh, academia and, uh, and literary uh, scholarship and decided to, to give that all up. It spent time in France and uh, was really starting to make a name for himself, uh, but gave that up and went back home uh, to his uh, Kentucky farm where he grew up and has spent the last, the better part of uh, the second half of his life farming that land. And so uh, as we come to the pastor's study today, I did pull one of his books off the shelf. I have many of his books. Um, I, uh, I don't have as many of his uh, novels, although I do have a I do have a collection, an anthology of his short stories. Uh, I, I have a lot of, uh, I don't, actually don't have much of his poetry either, but I have almost all of his essays. This is a book of collected essays uh, called What Matters? Economics for a Renewed Commonwealth. And in this book of essays, there is what is, I think, uh, one of the best essays that he ever wrote. Um, that's my personal opinion, but it's also the opinion of, of others whom I trust and admire who have said that um, this essay is, is one of Wendell Berry's best. <clears throat> and the name of the essay is entitled The Work of Local Culture. And um, I've listened, and uh, I have this essay as an audio recording, an audio reading, and I've listened to it many, many times, and I've read it several times, and I go back to it uh, time and again. Uh, over the years, and I found it to be a, a deeply insightful essay. And it came to my uh, remembrance this past week as I've been thinking about our social distancing and how many of us are home. Wendell Berry went back home, and home is a significant theme 
for Barry, uh, the land, the home, the farm. And uh, Barry went back home, and all of us are back home, we're in our homes, and uh, we are working uh, within the context of a very local culture, the culture of our homes. And uh, one of the things that Barry talks about in the essay is uh, a bucket, an old galvanized bucket. For many years, my walks have taken me down an old fence row in a wooded hollow on what was once my grandfather's farm. A battered, galvanized bucket is hanging on a fence post near the head of the hollow, and I never go by it without stopping to look inside. For what is going on in that bucket is the most momentous thing I know, the greatest miracle that I have ever heard of. It is making earth. The old bucket has hung there through many autumns, and the leaves have fallen around it, and some have fallen into it. Rain and snow have fallen into it, and the fallen leaves have held the moisture, and so have rotted. Nuts have fallen into it, or been carried into it by squirrels. Mice and squirrels have eaten the meat of the nuts and left the shells. They and other animals have left their droppings. Insects have flown into the bucket and died and decayed. Birds have scratched in it and left their droppings or perhaps a feather or two. This slow work of growth and death, gravity and decay, which is the chief work of the world, has by now produced in the bottom of the bucket several inches of black humus. I look into that bucket with fascination because I am a farmer of sorts and an artist of sorts and I recognize there an artistry and a farming far superior to mine or to that of any human. I have seen the same process at work on the tops of boulders in a forest, and it has been at work immemorially over most of the land surface of the world. All creatures die into it, and they live by it. What Barry says is that the bucket is, is no metaphor. It simply reveals what has always happened in the woods. There is the necessity for us to uh, go home, to go uh, back to the bucket. We have to go back to the bucket in order to replenish. Um, he uses the metaphor, well he says it's not a metaphor, but it's a sign of the way things are and, and the way in which God has uh, ordered up the world. Uh, the world is operating according to the grace uh, that God has, uh, has put into it and is sustained by that grace, as you heard at the beginning uh, segment uh, of the video. Uh, we need to return home, and we need to replenish the soil of home. It's important for us to live at home. And I know that being at home right now, as we're spending times in our houses and in our homes, to a degree that we may not have done so for quite a while, is a little bit disorienting. It's, it's not something that we're accustomed to. Uh, it seems to me that most of us don't actually live at home. We live at work. We live, uh, we live on airplanes and in our cars during our commute. We live on our phones. Uh, we live um, on the golf course or in our recreation. We live in a lot of places. And when you add up all of the time uh, in which we are living in those places... Um, the amount of time is really disproportionate to the time that we spend at home. We don't actually live at home. And I think that that's a bit remarkable and striking to consider. Uh, we do a lot of our living outside of the home. And one of the things that uh, our social distancing is requiring of us is to live at home. And um, I think one of the things that it's requiring us to do as we are returning home is to look into the bucket and to ask ourselves, is there good soil there? Uh, have we deposited things into the bucket that, have, uh, that are necessary, the necessary ingredients uh, that are, are needed to create that black humus, that, that soil, that rich earth that will produce growth? What are the deposits that we have been placing in home uh, so that it can be a place where we thrive? Um, we are at home. We're not used to living at home. And what we may be discovering is, you know what, it's, it's, it's difficult living at home. 
And is it difficult in part because I haven't put the investments uh, in home that uh, are now a resource for us to live from now that we're stuck here? It's interesting to me when I take the uh, theme of home as a, as a metaphor, as a sign, that it's true of our individual homes. And we've all been asked to spend time in our homes uh, and to avoid seeing each other. And there's a certain amount of, um, I would say, caution, necessary caution, that we don't go out of our homes for the, for the, for the sake of our neighbors and for the sake of trying to fight this, uh, this pandemic, the, the coronavirus. But there's going to come a time when we're, the pendulum is, gonna, is going to swing back, where the fulcrum is going to shift, and we're going to have the opportunity to come back out of our homes and to come to a place that we would call home, which is the church. And there may be some, uh, there may be some reticence to do that, some, some fear and uncertainty because of, um, because of uh, what we've heard and what we've just lived through. But there's a necessity to come home to come home and to do the work of development and soil building and soil making so that we can thrive. Uh, and, and the church is that place. The church is that bucket. The church is that place of home uh, by which um, we can build the soil, and we can grow together here. And if we're not re regularly returning home, we're not going to have a place from which to grow. Um, I, I just think that Barry's observations as a farmer and as somebody who's looked very closely at his culture and the work of local culture, the work of a bucket, the miracle that's taking place in a bucket in which soil um, is being produced is, is instructive to us as we think about our own homes and as we think about the home that we have as the church when we come back to here. Is this a place where we're making deposits, where we're doing certain things to create the rich abundance, uh, the matrix, the humus, humus by which we can grow uh, and, and be nurtured and, and develop. I wanted to make reference uh, to the Levitical uh, law as well. It is, the, it is the, um, the logic behind which God is making the laws for Jubilee, the year of Jubilee, in which God says, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of, uh, each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. Basically what God is saying, you shall return home. Come home. Come home. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows in itself, nor gathers the grapes from the undressed vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field. The year of jubilee is a year of rest in which the natural soil building process takes place, in which certain things, the land is at rest and is allowed to decay. There are certain things are allowed to decay. Uh, it may be that there are are things in our lives that need to decay. We've been called back to our homes. And the Lord may be using this time to, to decay some things in order to build the soil of our lives. Um, I have uh, spoken with the staff quite a bit over the last uh, number of weeks about the necessity for us to adopt what I've called COVID thinking. COVID thinking is a reimagining of how we're doing ministry. Uh, a re-envisioning of, of uh, how we're going to lead worship, how we're going to uh, how we're going to receive offerings, how we're going to communicate with you. The whole pastor study is part of COVID thinking, and you and I have an opportunity to reimagine some things uh, now that we're home, and we could see our time at home as something that is that that is stifling and difficult. Uh, and hard, and I'm sure that that is true. It's, it's true for me, and I know that that can be true for you, but it can also be an opportunity. We've been called home, and God uh, is using this time, I believe, to do some soil building, to produce some things in us in order that there might be a richness, that deep, dark, black 
soil, that humus by which things can grow and to develop. And so I want to encourage you uh, today to have a new imagination, to adopt some COVID thinking, that you've been called home. The Lord is calling you to your home. It is a, a year of jubilee in which we've been called home uh, to, uh, to enjoy some things in him that we don't necessarily get to do otherwise. I was reminded of uh, the prodigal son and the theme of coming home uh, this past week and an anthem that the choir sang about a year ago. It's February of, of 2019, so a little over a year ago. An anthem called Come Home by Craig Courtney. Uh, I remember it for two reasons. I remember it because of, uh, one, it uh, afforded Stephen Sparks a solo. Stephen Sparks is somebody I've gotten to know through the choir. He sings baritone. He's in our bass section, but he's got a beautiful, beautiful baritone voice. And uh, he was able to present that voice as an offering to the congregation and to the Lord uh, in the solo that, uh, that he sang. And I, I just remember... Um, I remember reveling and luxuriating in, in uh, Stephen's voice. It was, uh, it was a glorious and beautiful thing. And I remember the text of the anthem. It's based on a, a reworking of this hymn, uh, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. Calling for you and for me. See, on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me, come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. And uh, I think that that is an invitation that each one of us has been given today and in this season, this time of social distancing in which we've been called home. We've been called to our homes to do our living out of our homes, to make an investment in our homes, to allow some things to die in, a, in the work of an extreme local culture in our homes in order to produce something beautiful and something by which uh, we can live and, and grow. Uh, I want to leave you with um, the anthem. I was able to pull the anthem out of the archives, uh, and uh, it's not the greatest recording. I wish we had uh, some better uh, recording capabilities uh, in which you could hear uh, Stephen in the choir singing. Uh, it was a beautiful anthem uh, in which we heard it live. This is, I think, the, the next best option for us to relive it. And so uh, I want to leave you with this anthem and uh, with um, the message that I believe God is, is calling us home. He's calling us into our homes. He's calling us to take rest, to do the work of local culture, uh, and to grow. And so until I see you next time in the pastor's study, God bless.